last few where we discussed the repeat, interest, it doesn't really mean interest, but people peg that word to repeat. Uh, so we'll, for the sake of the people who don't know what repeat is, we're just gonna say interest. Interest when it comes to everyday stuff. That's what we discussed last week. We discussed the repeat in terms of household items uh, and stuff like that. We discussed repeat the varim, giving a favor to someone who gave you a loan or did a favor to you. Uh, and these kind of stuff. But today we're going to deal more in the sense of repeat. And this is wh why are we discussing this specific stuff? Because that's what we deal with. We're not big lenders over here. We don't own banks. So we're not uh, really dealing with repeat or right. Right? Repeat or right are, in other words, the Gemara is called repeat kitsutsa. Repeat kitsutsa means when I give you a loan, it has to be a monetary loan. I tell you in advance. When I give you the loan, you have to pay me back for $100, let's say, $110. You understand? That's called rebid or raita. Uh, but every other form of rebid, that means if I give you a loan, and then you just pay me, I didn't tell you to give me back extra $10. I, I, just, I didn't tell you anything, and you decide to give me back an extra $10, rebid the rabbanan. Because I didn't tell you in advance that you have to pay me that extra interest. Okay, that's already called rebid the rabbanan. So there's a major difference between rebid the raita and rebid the rabbanan. Rebid the raita, interest, which is the raita, I have to specifically tell the borrower on the get go, you gotta pay me back the interest. And he accepts. And rebid the rabbanan is something that I didn't, it wasn't, it wasn't a prerequisite. You understand? But I, anyways, I give it to you. Okay? Uh, another big difference between rebid the raita and rebid the rabbanan is rebid the raita. Beidin has the power to enforce the borrower to return the money. By Rebid the Rabbanan, Beidin doesn't have the power to enforce the borrower to return the money. Then there's something called Ha'aramat Rebid. Ha'aramat Rebid is basically, it's not really Rebid interest, it's basically the Chachamim thought you would come to do interest. One specific case, we also discussed this last week, is in a case where a person uh, he puts a clause that if you don't pay me on time, you're, you're penalized. Every time you don't pay me, you, you gotta pay me back. For every month you don't pay me, you have to pay me back extra money. That's called haramat ribit. It's not really ribit. It's not based on the loan. Haramat ribit is basically a penalty. Chachamim thought you would use this as a way to get interest. Why? Because I know the guy's not gonna pay me back. And I do want the interest. So I'm gonna put the penalty clause there on purpose. So he will pay me extra money. Now, before we're gonna start today's topic, which is a very, this is a topic that every single Jew deals with on a, I wouldn't say on an everyday basis, but on a monthly basis for sure, especially people who have kids. It's called uh, Sakhir. When you, um, uh, employer and employee. There is repeat cases when I hire somebody to do a job for me, and I could come to over the issue of repeat of interest. How so? We'll get to it. But before we're gonna to get to it, for the listeners who didn't hear our first year, Rebit is what we call, the tour calls it, it's a Gzerat HaKatu. That means Rebit is one of those Isurim that it's not understandable. Because any Isur in the Torah, any Isur in the Torah, who goes over the Isur? It's the guy who's doing it, right? There's no Isur in the Torah for the guy who's receiving. That he's, for example, if a person steals somebody from somebody's house, I break into the guy for it, me. Somebody brings into somebody's house and he steals. Mm -hmm. He's going over an isur, what? Geneva or Gazla. But the guy who, let's say I left my door open that night. Am I going over an isur? Mm -hmm. Now you're stupid for leaving your door open, right? Mm -hmm. But let's say I leave my door open on purpose. And I know I live in an area that people will come inside my house. Am I going over an isur of Geneva? I'm not going over an isur of Geneva. Rebit is one of the only isurim in the Torah where the person who's giving it and the person who's accepting it is going over. Even if a person is begging the lender, please, I want the money, you can't do it. Even if the guy is as rich as Trump and he wants to borrow on interest, he wants to borrow money on interest, he still can't do it. It's exactly like a it's crazy. So much crazy. And the but, but however, as the tour says, the one who doesn't get up in Tchiat HaMetim, resurrection of the dead, is only the, bar, is only the lender. Mm. The lender, who lends on interest doesn't get up in Chet Ametim. The tour says this. So, so who borrow who even agrees, he still gives up. The borrower, uh, I'm sorry, the lender. But but borrow, even he agrees on the interest because he has no yeah. choice. He does he gets up in Chet Ametim. Okay. He gets up in Chet Ametim. But, so, so, but he still goes over two, two lots. You understand? But the lender, he doesn't get up in Chet Ametim. 
There's a famous story that the Rav Avadia brings down in Anach Etzavot about the, uh, the great Rabbi Kiva Eger. You guys know who Rabbi Kiva Eger was, right? The great Rabbi of Posen. One of the One of the most, from the Achronim, the later rabbis, from about the year 1600, he's one of the greatest minds, one of the greatest. Um, his son-in-law was the Khatam Sofer. Mm-hmm. You guys know what the Khatam Sofer was, right? Rav Moshe Sofer. We could talk about these two giants a whole night. But the Khatam Sofer, how is he related to Rabbi Eger? Just say his son-in-law, Rabbi Khatam Sofer, Rav Moshe Sofer. He got married to a young woman at a very young age. And for like 30 years, they had no kids. And as much as people pressured him to divorce her, and she was a very rich woman, a very rich woman, and she was basically his, his life sustenance to support him, because she had a very rich brother, and he would support the Khatam Sofer, the Moshe Sofer. And he was around, when he was 50 years old, she died. No kids, nothing, Khatam Sofer. And when he was 52, I believe, he got remarried to, the, to a widow. She was the daughter of Rabbi Akiva Eger. Mm-hmm. And at the age of 52, he had his first son. Wow. 52. Mm-hmm. And this son, this son, he was known as the Ketab Sofer. He was a giant in Torah too. And his son was also a giant in Torah. So he didn't give up hope. Mm-hmm. At the age of 52, he got remarried to this daughter of the, of the, Rabia, uh, the, Hab, the Hatab Sofer. was very famous for a well-known story about a guy who didn't want to give a get to his wife. Mm-hmm. She didn't want to give a get. Uh, he didn't want to give a get. And we know... According to the Gemara, a man could impose on his wife to receive the divorce documents. You could impose on your wife. But the king, Rabbeinu Gershom, one of his seven excommunications, one of his seven haramim, was that you can't impose on a wife to get divorced. You can't force your wife to get a get. That was one of his harems. People know him as doing the harem, which harem? That you can't marry more than one wife. Yes, that was one of his famous haramim. But another one of his famous haramot, which we hold till today is that you can't force a woman to get again. You don't see why we hold it too? Yes, of course, everyone. Now, so there was one woman who wanted the get, but her husband didn't want to give the get. That already is the end of the If a guy doesn't want to give a get, he doesn't have to give a get, right? And he wanted to make her suffer. So they came to the Khatam Sofer, and the Khatam Sofer called over, he was a Rasha, the guy, big Rasha, he called him up, says, listen, a woman can get free from her husband in two ways. One of them is get a get, or the husband dies. You pick which way you want. The guy got so scared, that day he wrote the get to his wife, and because the Khatam Sofer, he was known as saying that he has the keys of halakha in his generation. Mm. That means whatever halakha he said, until today, Hungarian rabbis, they don't move from the Pesach of the Khatam Sofer. But the, 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 yeah, he was Hungarian. Okay. Now, the, his father, Rabbi Akiva Eger, was nothing less than him. In fact, some say he was greater than the Hatam Sofer. So Rabbi Akiva Eger in his town of Posen, there was one guy who died, and he was a guy who used to lend on interest. But not regular interest. I'm talking about Rabbi de Oraita. And when he died, the Hevra Kadisha comes to the Rabbi Akiva Eger and tells him, listen, the guy died, he never used to pay his dues. Back then, he used to pay your dues in a community. It's not like today, you've got to fight with that guy to give high dollars for a Hagbar. Back then, each one had to pay for a seat. Sure. Sure. Huh? Ashkenazim still, Ashkenazim still, Ashkenazim still do that. Do that. Ashkenazim. Ashkenazim. Membership. <laughs> Membership, it's called. I think even that's dying now. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, young Israel maybe still does that, but I think many shuls don't do that anymore. So what happened was, he, he died, and he used to lend them repeat, and they, they wanted to bury him, his sons. And the Chavar Kedisha said, no, we're not going to bury you. So they went to the, because this guy is a Rasha Merusha, we don't want to bury him in a Jewish cemetery. So they go to Rebid Kivi Eger, and they tell him the only way we'll bury him is if you force them to pay an exuberant amount of money. I'm talking about like 5,000 gold zivuvim, a large amount of money. Even for a burial today, for a plot in the cemetery, it's a lot of, it was a lot back then. And the Yorshim were like, no, we're gonna go to the Moshel. We're gonna go to the governor of the city. They go to the governor, the governor's like, listen, Rabbi Akiva, eager, how come you're imposing this, this tax on this guy? He doesn't, every Jew, pays, let's say, 300, 300 zilvim for the cemetery, 300 gold coins, while causing him to pay 5,000. He says, listen, everybody, everybody dies. After what, three, four, five hundred years, it's going to be tchetem etim. They're all going to get up. So they're basically just renting the spot. This guy used to lend an interest. So he's going to be in that cemetery spot for the rest of eternity. So since he's, he's basically buying the house, he's not renting the spot, so he's got to pay 5,000. And the guy said, okay, you have a good point, and he, and he forced the... Inheritors to pay 5,000 gold zuvim for the point, for the cemetery plot. Because this guy used to lend an interest, he has no tchet That body is gone, it's finished. He has to come back in a gilgul in, 
thing. Now, so interest is a very bad issue. We all know that. We discussed it last week. Everyone wants to listen, go listen. Today, we're going to talk about employer and employee. What's the halacha? It's called schir yom. The Torah in two places talks about if a person hires a guy to do a job for him. Now, when I say hires a guy, it doesn't just mean uh, I own an office and I'm hiring people to do work for me every day. I'm a boss. I'm a big boss. I'm talking about even if you hire a babysitter. You hired a babysitter. Or you hired a person to paint your house. You hired a person to fix the electricity in your house. Any of these cases, it doesn't matter. You hired a guy. You're the employer and he's the employee. You have a mitzvah asem in Torah to pay the guy on time. Be'yomo titen scharot, the Torah says. And if you don't, there's also a lot asem. There's also a negative commandment. You're not allowed to cause the guy to wait for his money. You can't cause him to wait. The same thing, just yeah, but the point is, like, for some mitzvot in the Torah, Actually, if I don't do it, I didn't go over a lot of I just didn't do the asset. Over here, if you do it, you did a positive commandment. If you don't do it, you're going over a negative commandment. This applies to Goyim also? This applies to Yehudi. Uh-huh. Yehudi. Talking about Jews also. Okay? Also, Rabbi. Rabbi yeah, only applies to employee. employee yeah. You know how, so, we're going to talk about in what case does this, does this mean? What does it mean? What, we first understand this that this employer employee relationship that the Torah says you must pay my time. And Chafetz Chaim, people think that Chafetz Chaim just wrote a book on Lashon Ara. Besides, for his magnum opus, which was the Mishnah Brura, he is a very famous for writing a book called Ahavat Chesed. I think it's even been translated. You just got it. It's, you just got it. In Russian. In Russian. It's, in Russian. it's amazing, Safer. You have to read it. You must read it. It's all about business. Ahavat Chesed. It's all about business. Anything you want to know about business is inside that book. Ahavat Chesed. Chafetz Chaim wrote. And he wrote in his introduction, in his introduction, on this mitzvah of paying a guy on time, an employer that has to pay an employee on time, he wrote, almost everybody goes over this issue. Almost everyone. Why? Not because they don't want to pay the guy. As many people who keep Shabbat, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Pesach, Shavuot, all the fasts, Tefillin, Lulav, Mezuzah, but they just don't know halachot of money. There's a lack of understanding in halachot of money. And if they would know, if you would educate the people, they wouldn't go over the Isur. They wouldn't go over the Isur, the Chavetz Chaim writes. And it's our obligation to teach this halakhot. Our obligation. So first of all, he says like this. When you, have an, uh, uh, when you hire a person by hour, by hour, not a contractor. I'm talking about you hire a person by hour. You hire a babysitter. You hire to babysit your children from, let's say, going to the party 8 o'clock at night till 12 o'clock. You have to pay her by sunrise. You have to pay her by sunrise. You understand? If you hire a person to do a job for you during the day, and he finishes that day, by sunset, you have to pay him. Even if you agree, they're going to pay you. I'm not talking about that yet, about agreements. Okay? On the Alpana, on the Pshat level of the Torah, the guy did a job for you in the day, before sunset, you have to finish the payment. A guy did a job for you at night. Before sunrise, you have to pay him. Okay? Now, let's say he finishes the job right before sunset. He just finished the job. It was a couple of minutes before Shkia. You have till the end of the following night to, fit, to pay him. And the same thing the other way around. If you finish the job right before sunrise, you have till the f- end of the following day to pay him. Okay, so basically in that, in the subsequent ona, the 12 hour period that's coming up, you have to pay the guy. Okay, this is your moral obligation. Your moral obligation as a Jew. As the Chafetz Chaim says, every time, every day that passes, and you didn't pay the guy, you're going over a lot. That you're forcing the guy to come to your house and pay him. He's knocking on your door. Pay me. There's even cases of this schir yom, the obligation to pay a guy on time. There's even cases, it could be for 10 years. You could be going over Yusuf for 10 years. For what 10 if, years. What if the guy forgave? Oh, wait a second. Now, when a person is obligated to pay, first, let's, let's, get, let's water it down a bit now. 
Now, I'm Abu Yad. Now, let's talk about a very easy case. Something that we go through every day. Oh, every, let's, every month or so. You have a babysitter come to your house. Okay? Now, you have to pay her for four hours of work. Okay? Now, she's, let's say, she's less than the age of 12. She's less than the age of 12. She can't forgive the fact that you couldn't pay her on time. To not pay a katan under the age of 13 for a man, under the age of 12 for a girl, is more chamur than not being able to pay a gadol. Why? A katan doesn't have the right to be mochel. Mochel, forgive. Forgive the fact that you couldn't pay him. You understand? A gadol, person who's above the age of 13 for a boy and above the age of 12 for a girl, can forgive the fact that you can't pay them. She can forgive, I'm mochel you. I let it go. You understand? So if you're hiring a katan to babysit your kids, now this could even be with your kids. This could be with your wife, it doesn't matter. All these cases are applicable even to close, people make this mistake, even to close family members this is applicable. You understand? You understand? Now, what if you hire a person, I get paid at the end of the month, or I get paid at the end of the week. We have a deal, you pay me every Friday or you pay me every 30th of the month, like you said. So if we that have a kind of agreement, then when are you obligated to pay the guy? At what time? At the time that you were covail with him, at the time that you agreed, every Friday I'm paying you to get the paycheck. You understand? Every 30th of the month, he has to get his paycheck. If you go over one day from that agreement, what is that? You're going over. You're going over the lota asif. Lota alim pulat sahir al boker. Okay? For every day that you're going that you're missing, you're going over a lot. And an asset. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. How severe this halakha is. How severe. If a person has to pay a guy for a certain job, let's say I hired you to translate something for me. Those people who translate books in English, I hired you. We set an agreement when I'm done, the work, six hundred dollars I, I have to give you. And I didn't pay him every time I used to say I Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And he asked for his money. He asked for his money. Because we're going we're gonna to come to the point where, to the halakha, that if the guy never asked you for the money, even though you set a time, I have to pay you every Friday, I never asked you for the check, then I'm not going over the isur. To go over the isur, the okay. lot, I have to ask you for the money first. Do you understand? Until I don't ask you, we assume that he's mochel. He's mochel that you're lateness. You understand? Also, for example, Let's say, we talk about Rebit right now for a second. Let's move to Rebit in, in this case. How does Rebit move, uh, tie into this? Let's say you're hiring me to paint your house or to, to, or to fix your house, right? And we set a time and date when I'm supposed to get paid. Now I know you're a guy or I'm afraid that you're not gonna pay me on time. So I specifically put inside the contract that if you're late, I'm paying me, for every day that passes, you have to you have to add ten dollars to the payment. That's repeat. Even though, even though that's repeat the varim already. Even though I never had the intention of collecting the repeat, I just put it in there as a clause to make you afraid to pay me on time because I'm afraid you never you're not gonna pay me on time. The fact that I put that clause in the contract, I'm already going over the usura repeat. Did you understand what I said? If you don't understand, you can ask. Let's say you hire me to do a job. Now I'm afraid you're not gonna pay me on time. So in the contract, I put a clause that if you're not gonna pay me on time, you have a penalty for every day that passes, every week, whatever the case is, every month, you have to pay me extra money. Even if I didn't have the intention of collecting the money, mm -hmm. I'm still going over the Isur. Over repeat? Over repeat, the Rabbana. The Rabbana. Even if you enter the, the credit, credit cards, credit card payments. Though. Okay, so credit card payments, so we talked about this last week. Did it? Credit card, yes we did. I didn't reveal. So he asked, Let's review it for a second. How about credit card payments? You understand? First of all, we have to understand. Let's, we didn't mention this. It's an important clause when it comes to Rebit. Rebit is only talking about Jewish people. I understand. Okay? I understand. When you're dealing with Rebit, with non-Jews, it's mutar. To borrow from them, it's right. mutar. There's so even a posek that says it's a mitzvah. We don't hold like him, but some say it's even a mitzvah. Okay, but... What? But if it was a Jewish credit card company. Yeah, but it's a oh. corporation. How did you hear? You heard it? I heard the like. You heard it like. See, he listened to it. You were here. You didn't really understand. Corporation. Any, any, if it's a corporation, right. there is one posek 
Let's say it's okay. But only one. It's okay to one. what? To charge interest. To charge to charge to pay the interest to the corporation. Even if it's a Jewish corporation. Yes. Because be... anything that's incorporated, uh-huh. anything that's right. its own entity. Exactly. The, person... the person who's lending it out, so... the person who's lending it out, he's not liable from his own pocket so to pay you. Uh, where do you where is you what happens if I don't pay the interest? Where does it come out of? The company's assets. So if there's a Jewish bank and they do that, they yeah. lend out loans. You, yeah. you can get a mortgage from a Jewish bank. Yes. They still do hetariska. Oh, because it's just in case. Because the posek who allows it is Yachid. Ah, ah, ah. He's Yachid. But it's a big Yachid. From Moshe Feinstein. He says you He said any, any, any entity that's incorporated, so, uh-huh. it's mutar, the, the, you don't need a hetariska. You don't need a hetariska. Is the same idea with Israeli banks? Israeli banks get hetariskas because they don't rely on this. They don't rely on Because it's a very. When you have one posek against uh, all the giants, even though he's a giant himself, you want to be. This is a sur de oraita. Yes, it is. But, but once again, if it's a loan, it's a sur de oraita. When it comes to merchandise, it right away turns to a sur de rabbanan. Rebit the mekach umimkar is rebit the rabbanan. You mean like buying your, uh, merchandise on credit? Yes. If I but let's say I come to you and I tell you, could you please sell me this book? Right. So if you're gonna pay me cash right now, I'm giving it to you for five bucks. If you're gonna make me on credit, I'm gonna charge you seven dollars. Mm-hmm. That's called repeat the metaf umim card. I'm not allowed to buy the one on credit. I have to buy the one on cash. You understand? For that they have what? What do they have? Heteriskas. Heteriskas to save on that. You understand? But today, if you go into a let's say I was I was in a bookstore today. Right. Now I had to, if I would have paid on cash, they would have given me the book for twelve bucks. Okay. He put he charged me thirteen eleven. On the credit card. Yeah. Why? He's not charging me for credit. For the credit. He's charging me tax. That's his... Right. You understand? So minimal tax is okay. But if I'm charging you a... a but there's a credit card processing fee that a lot of people so charge. You're for, saying that's... So that's what we said. If it's a credit, credit card processing fee, then you're allowed to charge that. Yeah, yeah. But if you charge much more than that, even if it's, if it's a pruta today, a pruta. How much is a pruta today? Anything that's less than a pruta... Quarter? Anything else? What's a pruta, guys? A penny? Masai I know. It's a, the, 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 what do you mean? It's currency. It's the lowest the form lowest. of currency that was worth something. Right. Any that's the least. You can't go less than a pruta. Anything that's less than a pruta is nothing. Okay, so how much is a pruta today? A pruta today, I heard from Mark Talber, a pruta today is about 45 cents. Um, a pruta today. It's about 45 cents. Oh, yeah. A quarter is not worth anything? A quarter is worth something. You pay mm-hmm. a meter or a meter. Yeah. Right? It's a quarter. But so there is stringent opinions. There's even less opinions. I heard of the Albert Chaim said it's 10 cents. Why well, go to a quarter? Go to a, well, you can't really buy anything with a dime today, you're saying. Right. Right? Yeah, so so there's, a, there's a, le- so that's the lowest, I think. A dime is the lowest one. The highest one, which a person should be Mahmir in case, for example, Kiddushin. You know, just to go on a small tangent, a small, we're going to go right back to the credit card thing. If a person, before a person gets married, under the chupa, what does the Masala Kedushin ask? He takes the ring, and then he goes to the two Edim, in front of the Kala, we do some purpose. And we ask them, is this ring Shave Pruta? Is it worth a Pruta? Why do we ask that? Do you guys know why we ask that? Many people don't know this. It has to be worth something. No. Actually, that's not the reason why. Obviously, she sees it's worth something. Uh-huh. She's not allowed to believe it's worth much more than the amount that she thinks. You understand? She, let's say she thinks she's getting married with a ten thousand dollar uh, ring, and it's really worth five thousand. Uh, the kiddushin is not chal. It could be va- uh, it could be invalid the kiddushin wow. uh, because her dot was on a ten thousand dollar ring. So we ask in front of her the shavet pruta to make her think. Listen, you're getting the minimal amount, your baby. <laughs> Don't think you're getting a lot of money. You're getting a, a small. That's why everybody you can't marry a woman with a diamond ring. You have to marry her with a. Everybody has the gold band. Uh, gold band. Uh, that's the set amount as whatever. No. So there's not gonna even that. Exactly. Now the, the thing is like this: most women today don't know what the word pruta means. Right. So what's the point in front of her of, of saying is it chave pruta? <laughs> so actually, I think it's a better idea, and I heard this from Poskin to say in front of the girl, "Is this worth a dollar?" The idea. You think this is worth a dollar? It's much more. You're doing much more. You're you're fixing the problem. The girl can run away when she hears that. But that's the whole point. <laughs> but that's the whole point. And away? I think at that point she's not running away. Uh, and this is not a runaway bride here, you know? This is, you know? 
So that's the that's why we say pruta. I have the couple start on a, 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 a suffix like oh my gosh, what am I getting into? It's giving me ring. It's worth a dollar. But everyone knows how much the ring is worth. They might be doing different stuff. Exactly. You know, that, on uh, the trust me, under the chupa, <laughs> he's doing teshuvah over there. He's crying. Right. And he's there, and she's, and she's jumping at the diamond ring. ring. <laughs> that's why we give her an engagement ring before that. Yes, that. So let's go back to what we were saying before. So lending on credit, uh, buying on credit. So when you're buying something on credit, if, the, if you know the guy is charging more for the credit, you're not allowed to buy his merchandise on credit. Now there is leniencies. I'm not going to get into that today. Okay, maybe in the next year on repeat. Now we're talking about employer employee. Understand? So back to what we were saying with the employer and the employee. Now, so I am not allowed to put a clause into the contract, the employer. Can put the employee can put a clause in the contract. If you don't pay me, you have to pay me extra money. That's called repeat, even though I don't have the intention of accepting the money. Okay, that's what we said. Now, another form of employer and employee is, is a contractor. That means I don't pay you for time, I pay you for work. I pay you for work. Now, when I pay you for work, when do I have to pay you? When the job is done and I pick up my item. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? So that means I gave to the dry cleaners, my clothes, and they dry clean my clothes. Mm -hmm. I'm paying them for their work. I'm not paying them for their time, right? Mm -hmm. So until I don't pick up my item, you know, I'm not obligated to pay them. Right. You understand? So I'm not going over the Isur here. Okay. I mean, if my car is at the body shop and the guy keeps on ringing his, my phone, your car is ready, pick up your car, and I, and I don't have the money to pay for the car right now. Is that considered steal? No. Because you're using up space in yep. the shop. Mm, using, uh, you could have a bit more money. Yeah, you know, your car's in the way. It's also... Yeah, maybe there's a story there of... Uh, I don't Did think it's stealing. Uh -huh. I don't think it's stealing. Maybe it's something else. But not or just giving him the aggravation of, uh, I want to get rid of this car. Yeah, it's not be nitty gritty over here. He wants to get, get paid. Huh? Or he just wants to get, get paid on time. Oh, so right. first, of, first of all, first of all, what, what could the guy do? What could the contractor do? He could charge him extra for the time that the car is in his body shop. That exactly. he can. That's not a rent. rent. That's not a rent. It's like rent. Exactly. That's like rent. That he can do. We were gonna get, I was going to get to that. That he can do. Now, let's say, and but back to the to the guy who's getting the service. Let's say I take the car to his house. I'm like, take your car already. Here's the keys. I have the right, if I don't have the money to pay, to say, no, I don't want the, I don't want the car yet. I'm not going over the Isur. Because he's a contractor. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, where does Rebit fit into this? into all this mess. The very two cases that you guys are gonna hear, you're gonna be like, it could be we're over the Isur. First case you could go over here, repeat, is a case of, let's say, back to the babysitter case. Okay, because it's an easy case to understand. I hire a woman, a girl to, a gadol, I means a gadola, above the age of 12, 12 and a half, really, to hire, to babysit my kids. And then I come home, and you know, you know, in Elite Palace, they take the pictures of the couple. You ever, you ever, you ever see that? Yeah. Then, and then they charge you like 50 bucks for that picture. Right. Really? So that, that's all the money, that's all the cash you had in your pocket, and you drink a little bit. So instead of paying the babysitter now the money, you by mistake use it on the picture. <laughs> you understand? Use it on the picture. So you come home, and you tell, and she's like, where is the, uh, where is the money? to owe me for my time it's 12 o'clock at night and you say listen I can't pay you right now let me compensate you and you take out here's extra five you have five bucks left in your pocket here's an extra five bucks take this money when I see you next time I'll give you give me a grace period you know what a grace period is give me extra time here's five dollars and instead of charging you fifty bucks I'm giving you fifty five dollars mm -hmm. that's Ruby that's Ruby. Mm -hmm. Compensation for grace period is Ruby. Mm -hmm. Now, look how far it goes. It doesn't have to do only with money. Even if I just take out a, let's say I tell my kid, I tell a child, go deliver this message for me. Mm -hmm. And he delivers a message and I don't have money to pay the kid and I give him a candy. So here's a candy, give me another day to pay you. That's Ruby. It's Ruby, Rabbi Tad. Compensation for grace period is repeat. What do you do in that case? You're gonna look a little stupid. What do you do? A person is not obligated to pay the person in certain cases. 
what case is number one if he doesn't have the money if you don't have the money to pay your employee you're not going over the isur until you have the money you understand what i'm saying what do you do to get that money the Chachamim say to pay your employee you have to go as far as to even borrow money mm-hmm. you gotta even borrow money to pay your employees because listen you owe them money you understand so but if you don't have the money you're not going over the isur so what do you do in the case where you have to pay your employee you don't have the money say i'm sorry i don't have the money right now when i have the money i'll give it to you but to compensate them for a grace period of extra couple of days it's rebeat that's rebeat rebeat the rabbanan but it's rebeat number two if the employer has limited funds i have limited funds and let's say I have to pay my employee, but on the other hand, I only have enough money to either pay them or to buy food for buy special food for Shabbat, Onik Shabbat. What's more important to do, pay the employee or get the money, uh, have Onik Shabbat? So the halacha is, but if you don't pay the person on time, you're going over two averot. One ase and one lota ase. By Onik Shabbat, you're only doing one ase, so obviously to pay them. Now let's say you have an employee, two employees and you only have enough money to pay one of them. Do you pay one the full amount, the other guy say, listen, I don't have the money right now, or is it better to pay half and half? And tell both of them, when I have the other half, I'll give both of you. So the Havat Chesed says, in this case, where you have two employees, and you only have enough money to pay one of them, or you could half the amount, it's better to half. <laughs> half and half, and then when you have enough money, pay the rest of the half to the both of them. Okay? But, in a case where an employer fears that he cannot pay the employee on time, what should he do? This is the best way to get out of this. You have to stipulate at the beginning of the employment period that if I don't have enough money, you have to give me extra time. Okay, that means you should already know in your mind that the money's not gonna always come on time. By doing that, by giving the employer that clause at the beginning of the employment, you're, you're saving yourself from all these surim over here. Uh, Nobody's going to accept that. But, once again, all these Yisurim only apply if they ask for the money. You understand what I'm saying? If they didn't ask for the money, then you don't have to pay them. You, have, you could assume they were mochil for a day or two. Okay? Now, sometimes it could be they're just embarrassed to ask for the money. Like, I know some people, like, when do you find this problem a lot in Yeshiva? Can you not, can you not wait for them to ask and you approach them? Through if you do that, situation. you're doing an asset. Mikhail mitzvat asset. You're going over, you're doing a positive command. Even if they didn't approach you, but you're going yourself and paying them, you're doing a mitzvah Not said. paying them, but asking, listen to the situation, I'll give you money tomorrow, is it okay? You know, yeah, you, of course you could do that. Then you're not, then it's like, a mochel. Then obviously they're mochel. You understand? Now, let's say cases like in yeshivot. In yeshivot, it's a known thing, teachers don't get paid on time. So you're gonna tell me the pr- principal and the board members are all going over your source every day? No. They tell them. Why not going over your shoes? Because it's a known thing. It's a known, uh, it's a known thing. It's a known thing when you're getting a job as a Rebbe or a teacher in Yeshiva. Don't expect your money on time. So the person who's the employee, he knows he's not getting his money on time. You know what I'm saying? So it's already, it's already, it's a known clause. Let's call. It. Okay. So those are ways of getting out of peulat sachir. Understand? Be able to understand now. We said one case of rebit when it comes to employer belief, compensation for grace period. Second case of rebit, of a contractor. And the contractor says, if you're gonna pay me before my job, I'm gonna give you a discount. But if you're gonna pay me at the end, I'm gonna give you full, oh. uh, full price. Is that rebit or not? What does that compare to the case of merchandise? I'm buying on credit or I'm not buying on credit? A, so just like in that case where it's Rebid Rabbanan, so too in this case it's Rebid Rabbanan. You understand? So if you're hiring somebody to fix up your house and, and he tells you, listen, if you're gonna pay me right now, I'm only gonna charge you 600. If you're gonna pay me at the end of the job, I'm gonna charge you 650. You're not allowed to take the 600 offer. You have to go with the 650. You have to go with the 650, you understand? Unless the guy starts the job right away. 
And at the, at, the, at the moment that you guys made the deal of taking the 600 instead of the 650, he starts the job right away, then you're not going over your beat. But if you're gonna take the 600 offer and he's gonna start the job in two days, you are going over the Isur of repeat. Now I wanna say one more thing, then we're gonna go jump to issue. When it comes to repeat, the Shulchan Aruch says, when you're dealing with non-religious Jews, when you're dealing with non-religious Jews, it's okay to lend them on repeat. So what does that mean? It means every non-religious Jew that comes along, I have to, I get, I get, it's Isur the Oraita. How could you say Gzal? One of the worst Isur in the Torah. The tour, the tour, says only in two places. You know, the tour is very big. The Shulchan Aruch is smaller than the tour. The tour, out of all the halachot, only in two places does he say to be very careful from this sin. His Lashon is Yizaher Me'od Me'od. One place is in Arayot. Arayot. Arayot is what? A person who does immoral behavior with women. And the second is in Herbit. The only two places he says Yizaher Me'od Me'od. Uh, who would have thought that if I'm giving the a little compensation for another couple of days for paying the guy, I'm going over Herbit? Mm. Who would have thought that? But it is Herbit Rabbah. You understand? And not only that, it's, it's crazy to think, because you have to fit your reality to the Torah, not the other way around. You have to understand that lending on Rebid is worse than Michalel Shabbat. You understand what I said? Lending on Rebid is worse than Michalel Shabbat. Michalel Shabbat, you get to come to Tichat If it's a true no? Huh? But it wasn't the true one. The person did a sin, Michalel Shabbat or Rebid? What is worse? If he doesn't return the Rebid, he's not getting back to Tichat Amitim. Isn't the Chalash Shabbat Karet? It is Karet, but he still got Tichat Amitim. What's Karet? Karet is not the... Karet is not the... No, no. Karet means the person's dying early. Oh. Also, oh, Karet. You understand? But that's, uh, that's what it means, you know? First one, on a side phone. First one wants to fix his Karet. What should he do? Learn all night. Learn all night. Why? Karet, Otiyot, Keter. When do we get the Keter? Keter is the crown. Uh-huh. When a person learns all night, he gets a crown on his head in the morning. Chutzel Chesed. That's his keter. So if you want to you want to fix the karet, you gotta change it to Otiyot keter. It's a side point. Okay. Now, oh, so what about the not how does Shulchan say I could lend to a non-religious Jew? So the Achronim explain what does that mean? What kind of Jew is that? If you know a Jew, if you know a Jew that grew up in a religious home, religious home, and he left the path of Torah till he threw away everything and became an atheist. That Jew, you're allowed to lend to an interest. But it has to be that he's a total mumar. That means he threw away everything, doesn't believe in one bit. And he also grew up in a religious home. That means without the, those two conditions, you can't lend to him on interest, a Jew. All other Jews, who were Michalel Shabbat, even Bepharhesia, Eid and Yom Kippur, all those kind of stuff. If they didn't grow up in a, in a religious household, you can never really say that they know the Yisrael. They can never really have that status, okay? So that's gonna end the uh, section for the Rebit, okay? We went a little over time for the Rebit, but it was an interesting topic. Today we're gonna talk about also for Ishut, Halachot Ishut, uh, back to Siman Reishin. So yeah, last week we were talking about Halachot, about, uh, about being light in the room, and um, you can't do it standing up, sitting down. Uh, in the bathroom, we said the Shulchan Aruch a little bit about hot. This is Zohama over there. Uh, today we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna touch upon the case. Two things over here. If a person is uh, new to the marriage, I mean, this is his first time. Is he allowed to have some light inside the room to for some guidance? For some guidance. Now we know we have in the Sephardi world we have we have two big luminaries in the last hundred years. Rose of Avadi Yosef. Say really 107 years, and one is the Benish Hai. Most of the times, who's Mahmir and who's Mekel? Is Mahmir and, uh, and Ravadia is Mekel. Over here, it's just the opposite. Ravadia is Mahmir, Benish Hai is Mekel. Benish Hai holds that if it's your first night, it's your first night, you're allowed to have the light, a little light inside the room, so you could not look like an idiot, let's say. It's obviously your first time because you're a Sadiq. But according to the Earl of Adia, you're not, you're, not, you're, not, you're not even allowed to have that. Even if it's just your first time. You understand? What's the reason for the Benish Hai's kula? 
What's the reason for the Vinish high schooler? Because what's the problem? The problem is if you get her pregnant. Mm -hmm. Understand? If you're gonna get her pregnant while there was light in the room, mm -hmm. the child is gonna come out with what? Azut metza. Understand? What does Shulchan Aruch say over here? Had mishamish mitato leor haner ha'aviyan lebanim nichim. He's gonna have kids. Nichim. We don't. I don't really know what the translation is. Mamash, but nichim means. Some people say it's epilepsy. The child will suffer at some stage of his life from epilepsy. That means if you were mishamish with your wife at the, with the, where the candle was, there was light a little in the room, uh, on purpose, obviously. I'm not talking about light that's coming in from your window, the shades couldn't block it out. And you, she got pregnant from that, God forbid the child could have some neurological damage. Well, the first time you can't get her pregnant. Oh, so that's why the Benish High said it's okay. Alavadia says it doesn't matter because it's not just because of getting the woman pregnant, it's also mitam tzniut. And the first night there's more busha. And she's gonna be even more embarrassed. So even then, Alavadia says you can't have light in the room. Uh, the Ari says there's a very big issue of having light in the room while you're with your wife. The Ari says that he saw a man, Negulgal, reincarnated in a goat from the time of the Tanaim. Tan Tanaim. You know Tanaim? Tani, I'm talking about like 800 years before the Ari mm -hmm. The guy was Migulgal still in a goat. For 800 years, he was in a goat. Why? Because every woman, every child that he had was when he was with Mishamash with his wife, the Why a goat? Why a goat? I don't know. How it's a good question. Goat was 800 years old. No, obviously, the guy went through a lot of kafakelas. This was already one of his higher Gilgulim that he was in the goat. But he was in the goat. For eight, I mean, for not for eight hundred years in the goat. I mean, that's why I misunderstood you. There, it wasn't eight hundred year old goat, but um, it was till he he was still Nigulga. Why? Because he caused his kids to suffer from this disease called Nichfin. Some say it's epilepsy. Um, so Mishamish Lo is a big deal, like we mentioned last week. Now today, I want to discuss a different thing. To another thing, I want to discuss is um, it says over here. Uh, now, once again, I want to apologize to anybody who is offended by the way I talk. I'm trying to talk as clean as possible, but sometimes you just can't talk clean over here. Okay, so I'm not anti-women or anti-anything. This is just the words of the Shulchan Aruch. Right? If he's on the bottom, and she's on the top, Zo derech azut shimshu shenehem keechad ze derech ikesh. The Shulchan Aruch says, if she's on the top and he's on the bottom. Now, some people are gonna are gonna want to learn this Shulchan Aruch saying, oh, he's not saying it's asur. He's just saying it's not nice. It's not nice. He's saying ze derech azut. Azut means it's a brazen way of being mishamish your bed. It's a brazen. Only for, for uh, when trying to conceive or in, in general. In general, the derech azut, the derech ikesh. Ikesh is a stupid way of doing it. You understand? So, oh, he's not saying it's asur. You understand? So, okay, so once in a while I'm stupid. What's the big deal? When the Shulchan Aruch uses strong language, it's going above asur. Mm. He's saying it's disgusting in the eyes of Hashem. That's the way animals. You're acting like an animal. I'm saying that, for example, when a person prays Shahari and suddenly he skips Korbanot and he goes to Baruch Shahamar, then after he's done, he goes back to Korbanot. What do we say that Yisur is over there? He's Mehafeh Olamot. He takes the world and turns them upside down. When you're with your wife together, you know what you're doing in that moment? There are three times of the year you cause a huge Zivug in Shamay, a huge, con inter I call it, intercosmic connection in heaven. It's a time of a huge Shefa comes out to the world. The highest time, the highest time, is on uh, Shavuot morning in Musaf. That tefillah is gigantic, gigantic. Another time is the Seder night. You cause a huge thing in Shammai, huge Shefa comes down. Another time is on Shmini Atzer, it's Simchat Torah. Huge Shefa, huge, huge interconnection. But you don't understand, you're doing that every time you're with your wife. It means when you're with your wife together, you're causing a Zivug in Shammai, you're bringing together worlds in Shammai, at the same level as Shavuot morning, Pesach night, and Simchat Torah morning. 
Every single time. That's why the power of you being with your wife together to bring down Nishamo. You're actually bringing down Nishamo. Do you know what you're doing when you're with your wife? You know what kind of holy thing it is? It's so holy, you're bringing, you're, you're creating something. That's what kind of high level it is. It's crazy, but there's Kavanot even of being together with your wife. There's Kavanot. Yeah, if you want your child to be a tzaddik, there's Kavanot. I heard of a Mikubalim that are, they know that the, the different configuration of God's name of every hour, and when they're with their wife, they think of that God's name of that hour. One rabbi who taught us, he said he knew this, that the name of God that he was thinking of when his son was conceived. He was teaching us once a long time ago. Now he lives in Kiryas Yolo, Kiryas Yolo. So we stopped learning. And it's, it's a huge thing, it's, it's gigantic. I'm talking about the same level of Shavuot morning. Do you know from Mekubalim, Shavuot morning is the most exciting uh, day of the year. Even more than Pesach and Simchat Torah. Shavuot morning is after that mikvah, you dip in the mikvah and you pray Musaf. When you say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Shem Echad in Keter, it's like the most bombastic moment of the whole year. Higher than Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. And you're doing that every time you're with your wife. Now what happens if you're with your wife and you're thinking about a different woman? Chas v'shalom. Not only are you mehafech olamot, but the child that's born from that conception, he's... His tum'ah, his neshama, is close to the tum'ah of a, of a mamzer. A tum'ah of that child is close to the tum'ah of a mamzer. I heard you're creating the spiritual mamzer by thinking about mamzer. Yeah, it is. You, you're, the child that's born is like a spiritual mamzer. He's not an actual mamzer, he's a spiritual mamzer. Oh, how come Yaakov Avinu, when he woke up that morning, he thought it was like, uh, he thought it was Rachel, and suddenly it's there. So probably Reuben, God forbid, was close to a mom. God, God forbid to even mention such a thing. You think Yaakov Avinu was thinking about a woman while he was with his wife? His all of his thoughts was kedusha, benish haizel and rafu alim. But Yaakov Avinu, when he was with his wife, he was having such. It was the first time in his life a drop came out of him. Sixty-four. Eighty-four. Of course, sixty-four. Yeah, sixty-four. Yeah. If it was sixty-four. We only have to fast sixty-four fasts every time. Because of the zera Every time a person does zera lavatella, how many fasts? Eighty-four. Eight. Eight. Why? What yeah. age was Yaakov when he had first had his drop? Eighty-four years old. You understand what I'm why, saying? Why didn't he get married at 16? Yeah. Why didn't he get married at 16? He couldn't find Rachel. Rachel wasn't born yet. <laughs> he knew it was bad zubos. Don't worry about Yaakov Avinu. Like, he knew it was bad zubos. Okay, he was also very handsome. He was one of the four most handsome men to ever live. So he could have got any girl he wanted. Yaakov Avinu? Yeah. Yaakov Avinu, Yaakov, Yosef, Ad- Adam, Adam Arishon, and... and uh, Shaul. Huh? And Shaul, very nice. And Shaul. And some say also Rabbi Abahu. Rabbi Abahu. One of the Amoraim. Shufre uh, the Rabbi Yochanan. Rabbi Yochanan Rabbi too, but Rabbi Abba, Rabbi Yochanan didn't have a beard. So, in the Gem- he didn't have a beard, yeah. Oh, he that's why you confused him for. That's why you confused him. Yeah. yeah. He, the, the Gemara says he didn't have hair, facial hair. Oh, some people, so some people, genetically speaking, some men can have. For example, one of the guys that learned with us in the Kol has very few uh, facial hair. Yeah. He just has a little here, here. Okay. Rabbi Yochanan had nothing. Baba Sali, when he was a young boy, he said about himself, he couldn't, he couldn't have any facial hair. Because he took after his mother's side of the family, and they had almost, they were very not hairy. <laughs> and he prayed, he prayed. Uh-huh. He used to hold the Benish Hai's picture because the Benish Hai had the most perfect beard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he used to take his Benish Hai's picture when he was a kid. He used to take the Benish Hai's picture, and he used to cry in Tikkun Chatzot, tears upon tears, until Hashem, he said, Hashem blessed me, and suddenly a couple of hairs started to sprout on my face. A zakan is huge. A zakan is huge. Not to say, Rabotai, that. A person has zakan, this is called zakan ha'elion, for men. Now you have also zakan ha'tachton. Zakan ha'tachton is the zakan that surrounds your yeso. You understand? Now a person goes and he lasers it, razors it, shaves it. You're cutting, you're cutting off a men's shefa in your life. Immense shefa in your life. When a person is taking down all the hair. From his, the Benish Chai says even your armpit hair is, is a secret of shefa. Even your armpit hair. Secrets of Shefa. For a woman, it's a curse, the Gemara says. It was woman time the Beit Midash didn't have any body hair. The time of the, after the Khorban, they were cursed with hair. My grandma said it's Gitin. So that's something else. But for men, the Zakan, God forbid it. Now, when a person raises it off, oh, that's why it's such a big issue, raising off your, you're cutting off immense pipes of, of, life, of life in your, I don't want to get into the Avera right now of, 
shaving with a razor. That's another point of our issue. We're talking about right now this now. Um, so a person is not, a, so we said a person who thinks of a different woman while he's with his wife is a very big issue. And God forbid if he even gets pregnant from that, what? And Yaakov Avinu did not go over that, obviously, because he wasn't thinking about women while he was. If he was thinking about women, obviously, he would have known it was Leah in the middle of the night. I mean, come on. So, uh, Yishai also, yes? Huh? Yishai also, he, didn't, he wasn't thinking about women. But for David Amelech, it's a bit different. Why? Because he says, mm-hmm. He says, I was made in sin. So, David Amelech and Abraham Avinu, it's a bit different because they were specifically souls that were stuck into deep klipa, deep, deep, deep. It means when Adam HaRishon sinned, there were four levels of neshama, four levels. First two levels are souls, first level are souls that left him. They weren't in the sin, like Yosef HaTzadik, Rabbi Yishmael ben Elisha Kohen Gadol. Second level of souls were souls that stayed in him after he sinned. Third levels of souls were souls that he gave to Cain and Hevel as an inheritance. And the fourth level was that at the time of the sin, these souls went deep inside the realm of the satan realm of masters mm-hmm. now there were souls that went in 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent 40 there were souls that went in 100 percent i mean these souls are not supposed to come out ever mm-hmm. they're supposed to be the chelik of adam bilyal shalom. those were the souls of abraham two of those souls were abraham avinu and david amelech that means they were souls that had immense creeper on them so they were supposed to come out through a ruse you know what I'm Hashem had to create a ruse to get them out. Everybody knows this drasha. Avraham Avinu was made while his mother, uh, Amtalai Bat Karnevo, was Tumat Nida. Uh, Yishai wanted to marry his Shifcha. Vekule, vekule, vekule. So, David Amalek is not a good example. Okay? Because he himself says, Bechet yichamat ni imi. Ki ba'avon kolalti, Bechet yichamat ni imi. I was made through sin. What was the chet? The chet was... The chet was that he was with he was with his wife. Without knowing, that without knowing that it was uh, her, he thought it was the shifcha. He thought it was the shifcha. Yeah. Okay, uh, and by the way, that when his when his mother got pregnant, the midrash says, and everybody, nobody knew that it was her. She was, she was with Yishai and she left. Yeah. And suddenly she sees they see after three months she's pregnant. Kill they want to kill her. You know this, and the, they saw David Amelech was a mom's there. But he was he also looked different than his brothers. Uh, he was shorter, all of his brothers were nice, handsome, tall. His, he was short, reddish hair. Uh, the, the Zohar says it doesn't really mean red. Uh, gold is another shade of red. He had golden hair. He had, one, one, yeah, one, he, had, one, there were, he wasn't red. He had seven different types of yellow in his hair. The Gemara says, seven, there are seven types of gold. The Zohar, sorry, the Zohar says this. Uh, there's Zahav Ophir, Zahav Parva, Zahav Parva, reddish gold. So he had these kind of seven shades of gold in his hair. So he's a blondie. Uh, and he had the uh, bluish eyes, the Zohar says, and he was short. He was, he was not tall. He didn't have the countenance of a king. His brother, on the other hand, uh, All his brothers were like, especially the eldest one. But the eldest one had a problem with cocks. As we know, and when you're, when you're an angry guy, you can't be king. So he lost it. Okay, but back to what we were saying before. So if, he's on t- if she's on top and he's in the bottom, the Shulchan Aruch says, Aderech Ikesh. Now, this is this is a isur. You understand what I'm saying? It's you're not allowed to do it. You understand what I'm saying? So the Shulchan Aruch is telling you that this is something the stupid people do. Is are we stupid? We're not stupid. Not say you did it already. But basically, it's only one way. The, the way. No, nah, exactly. So we already learned last week. You can't do this now. Nah. I'm gonna tell you something. So they say, okay, I can't do this now. Nah. Then the Shulchan Aruch says. You can't look at your wife's private parts. That's the room, you don't see anything. Yeah. Now, wait. Anybody who looks at there, at that spot, now, it's not only talking about a woman's private part, your wife. Even a person, God forbid, the Rambam says anyone who looks at Arayot, he can't do Teshuvah. It's one of the stuff that stopped him from doing Teshuvah. Rambam looks at Al-Khot Teshuvah. We're 30 days before Tisha B'Av right now. You start to start learning about Tisha B'Av, about Tisha B'Av. So obviously you gotta start learning about B'Tam Yidaf right now. So when a person uh, goes, God forbid, on uh, websites of Arayot, of Znut, and he looks at that, and the, obviously they show these kind of disgusting things. This also applies to this halakha. En lo boshet panim. He has no boshet panim. He, he's not a guy who could get embarrassed. Why is he saying that specifically? Because the Gemara Masechet Yibamot says. 
Jewish people are blessed with three attributes. Busha. One of them is Busha. <coughs> if you don't have Busha, what does that mean? In the uh, There's a question on your Yichus. There's a question on your status as a Jew. How do we know that Givonim were not Jews, the Givonites? They had no Busha, no Rahmanut. And he's over in Isur. You have to go with modesty in front of God. The Ma'avir Habusha Malpana. Not only that, you cause you you cause yourself to even go less in this mitzvah of modesty. Now you're gonna do this avera. When you're gonna go outside, you're gonna have even less busha. You're gonna to want to do even worse things. Shekola mitbayesh enochot. Anybody who has busha, modesty, embarrassment, he doesn't sin. Dichtir uba'avur tiyeh yiratol kenechem. God said, I bless you. You should have fear on your faces. What's that busha? You cause yourself that the Yetzer Hara will play at your heart. You're causing your Yetzer Hara to be midgare at your heart. One who looks at that spot now. I'll tell you a little secret. The Shulchan Aruch says next. Okay, okay I'll say it's dark in the room. I'm not looking at it. The Kol Hanoshek Shar. Anyone who kisses that spot. I'm talking kiss, I'm talking the actual flush. Not through the article of clothing. Anyone who kisses that, uh, that now this, that these days, this days of, we have, we're living in an age of pure madness. These things are actually uh, known to be, uh, by psychologists, I'm telling you, by psychologists, these things are known to be healthy in a, in a relationship. It's known to be healthy. Shukhan Aruch says, Kol HaNosheksha. Forget about what the goyim tell you to do for enjoyment. Just Nosheksha. Without an article of clothing that separates, over al kol elu, gam over al bal tishaketzut nafshotachem. He's also going over isur of making yourself dirty. The Shulchan Aruch says it's a isur muklat to kiss that spot of a woman. You're going over multiple isurim, and you're midgare yetzer hara. You lose your boshet panim. You're going over hatsne alechel. You're going over bal tishaketzut. Now. A person doesn't just kiss that spot. He, I don't want to say the word, does stuff to that place with his mouth. He's not going over Balta Shaketsu, he's going over Toeva. Toeva is one of the worst words when it comes to uh, immoral, immoral acts. Now, the Shulchan Aruch says this is Asur, but he doesn't mention when a woman does that to a man if it's Asur. I think we want to talk about it, no? It's, uh, it might lead for him to... Zerah yeah. Zavatala. Well, let's say she's, she's just goes, mm-hmm. she does it, and then right away you're going to finish over there, in the right spot, where it's not Zerah Zavatala. Is that Mutara Asur? So it's a, it's a Makhluk at Akronim, to tell you the truth. It's a Makhluk at Akronim. Some actually call it Bia Shalok Adarka. Bia, being together with her, not in the right way. Some people say Bia Shiloh which is the most accepted, is by doing it from the back. Dari said, a person who does a woman from the back, even if she wants it. If she wants it, now, once again, I apologize for even saying this kind of stuff, that's the halachat of Ishud. He's Ra'ui to be in Kherim. And there was a story in time of Dari where a guy was with his wife from the, even if she, even she wanted it, they put him in Kherim and they kicked him out of Tzfad. How do they know? Yeah. <laughs> how do they know? I'll tell you how they knew. Back then, they used to have Mishmarot. Mishmarot was they used to gather every Arab Rosh Chodesh and they used to tell each other their sins. By the Busha, by telling you my Averot, it already saves me the Busha from the Shara, from heaven. Wow. You understand? So he let it go, the secret, and they put him in Kherm and they even kicked him out of Tzfat. They, they put on him Galut for doing such a thing. Now, if a woman does that to a man, she's not going over Baal Tashakatsu according to most achronim, because the place doesn't have the acidity of when a woman, because it's flesh, but it's not inner flesh, it's outer flesh. But, but, according to the Ari HaKadosh, it's Asur. According to the Ari and many, and Mekubali, according to the Mekubali, if a woman does that to a man, he's mehafech olamot. He causes destruction to the world. Barmina, barmina. According to the achronim, according to the poschim, it's not such a big issue for a woman to do that to a man. It's not something that we teach 
that you could do that, and of course it could cause zera levatala, especially when a man doesn't have the ability to hold himself inside. So it's not something that's recommended at all. But the Shulchan Aruch doesn't mention it. Okay, the Shulchan Aruch himself doesn't mention it. Okay, but many Achronim hold that it's Asur. Why? Because you're going over the Hatznea Lechadim Elokecha. It's not something a Jew that has Boshet Panim does with his wife. You understand what I'm saying? It's not something a person has Yerat Shamayim does with his wife. It's something that it doesn't fall under a disgusting act, but it falls under the fact that you don't have Busha on your face. It is worthy to do Teshuvah if you did such a thing. You got Teshuvah for such a thing. You understand? Huh? For who? The man or the woman? For both of them. They both have to do Teshuvah. The man for asking for it and the woman for doing it. You understand? But some kav zechut, some kav zechut, it's not written in the Shulchan Aruch. So it's not something that Shulchan Aruch thought that it should be written down. But the Achronim do discuss it. Some hold it's Biyash Elokit Arta. It for sure could cause Zerah Levat Hala. But uh, once again, it's Ra'ul to do Teshuvah in such an act because you lose your Boshet Panim and you are Midgarei Yetzer Hala on yourself. You're causing the Yetzer to become strong inside of you. When you're gonna go outside and you're gonna see stuff, especially in the summer, your, your Yetzer will be even more emboldened to go against you. Okay, let's read one more Hala and we'll call it a day. Bait uh, Aher it says over here, Asur lishamesh bitato lifne kol adam. You're not allowed to be together with your wife when you're inside the room with someone else. Afilu imhu neor. Lifne kol adam imhu neor, if he's awake. Vafilu alide hefsek mechitza asara bifne tinok. Shein yogi ala daber. Alide hefsek mechitza asara. Even if you have a mechitza between the person that's awake and you, even then it's asur. But bifne tinok she'en yodeh ledaber mutar. In front of a child, in front of a child, you are allowed to be with your wife. If it's a child that doesn't know how to speak yet, if it's a child that knows how to speak, it's asur. Under two. Under two, basically. Some kids start speaking at one and a half. You understand? By chiyesh bo sefer Torah, a house that has sefer Torah of chumashim or chumashes, ha'asuim begilila that's made like a Torah and gilila asur lishamesh bo ad she'be fanal mechitza. If you have something in your house that's in your room, to be more exact, that has kiddusha, you have to cover it. You gotta double wrap it. You understand? Let's say you have another house and you have a separate route for much inside your room. Basically, another door. You gotta take it out of your room and put it over there. You're not allowed to put that. You're not allowed to rely on the fact to put two coverings on it because you could take that and put it in the next room. Now, let's say you're in your room and you have a bookcase. And you don't want to do it in front of your kids. In front of your kids. It's a very important halacha, very big kula from Ramon de And uh, so you go to the living room. And in the living room, you have a bookcase with sefarim and stuff like that. You got your tefillin you put inside your closet. No, no, a book, bookcase with a glass yeah. door. So even without the glass door. If, it has a, if you have a bookcase with a glass door like this, it's for sure a good mechitza. And you could be together with her like this. And more than the says, even if it doesn't have a bookcase, a uh, um, glass case, you're still allowed to do it if the bookcase is higher than 10 tefakhim. 10 tefakhim is about uh, 80 centimeters. 80 centimeters. If it's about 80 centimeters tall, your bookcase, mm -hmm. even if there's no covering on the bookcase, you're allowed to move your wife in that room. Why? Because the bookcase is considered its own reshoot. Mm -hmm. it's, like it's like a reshoot within the Rishut. Obviously, a person shouldn't rely on this Kula if you can actually cover them. You understand? So, uh, so that's all for today for Al-Khut Ishud. Hope you guys enjoyed it and we'll meet next time. Amen, amen.